Hello, everyone, and welcome into another edition of To The Point Podcast. Everybody's doing well on this Thursday. And what a Thursday it is. It's not, you know, just, you know, mid-February, Super Bowl week, nothing to talk about. There's lots to get into today, and I have a lot of opinions about a lot of different things, which I'm sure is hard for a lot of you to believe. But uh, just some housekeeping to start off uh, later today, later this evening, uh, Adam Beers will join me. We will start to preview Super Bowl 56 between the Bengals and the Rams. We'll get into a lot of different topics. We're also going to we're also going to talk some golf, uh, which is an interesting uh, little league in Saudi Arabia starting up in the world of golf. So we'll touch on that tomorrow. Matt, uh, writer Matthew Wright will join me, and we'll start. To, we'll also discuss the Super Bowl. So there's lots of coverage coming about. You know vis-a-vis Super Bowl in the next 48 hours. So keep on the lookout for those podcasts coming your way in the very near future. Now, there's so many ways I could start today's show. You know, there's the NBA trade deadline. There's a blockbuster that just happened that I predicted would happen the other night when I talked to Seamus Fillmore. So I'm happy about that. There's the Brad Marchand suspension which I'm not happy about, Uh, and we're going to get into that. Is Tuka Rask a Hall of Famer? It's a debate in and of itself. Canadian men and women at the Olympics, hockey, winning, dominating. They're They're looking well. Two head coaches fired in the National Hockey League, both from Canada, oddly enough. And that's where I want to start. And I'm going to start La Belle Provence in Montreal. And it comes out yesterday that the Montreal Canadiens, following a 7-1 loss New Jersey Devils Tuesday night, have fired Dominic Ducharme. So initially, I'm not that surprised, but I am a tad because this team is is not a good hockey team. They're going to be picking in the lottery and they're a team that's destined to pick in the top three. So them losing, maybe losing 7-1 to a team like New Jersey, who lost to Toronto 7-1 the week prior, was a pressure point that the Molson family, that the ownership group in Montreal just couldn't look past. And I'm okay with that in a sense. If you're going to, there's, you can tell a coach, lose games, and I'm paying you. That's 100% wrong. Steven Ross in Miami, that's not how you handle business. However, if you have a team that's not playing well, and you say, we're going to trade off some assets anyway, which is, you could say that's tanking, or it's just playing the game. You trade assets at the trade deadline when you're not going to make the playoffs. That's business. So you can do that. Keep Dominic Ducharme on the bench. And if you're going to suck, be as bad as you can be. Win an NHL, win a draft lottery. You know, I, I've been on the record. I don't think Shane Wright is that good of a hockey player. You know, he's going first overall. So he is obviously pretty good. Do I think he's a generational talent? I don't. I think he's more close to a Jack Hughes, Nico Heischer than he is a Connor McDavid or an Austin Matthews. That doesn't mean he won't be a good player. But when you have an opportunity to drop number one, and you have confidence in your development staff that you can improve, that you can get better, of course, you go all in on that. You want that first pick to set yourself up for the long term. So I'm completely fine with that. But if that's not the plan, if if Montreal firing Dominic Ducharme is about optics, is about we can't lose 7-1, well... This is the optimal year to lose these type of games. And here's exactly why. In Ontario, in Quebec, in New Brunswick right now, there are 500 people that are allowed in rinks. Montreal couldn't fill the Centre de Belle if they wanted to. They can't. It's 500 max. And it's likely to stay that way at least for another three weeks till you get to 50%. Then it's another three weeks 
till you get back to 100. So that's mid-March before you get 100% back in the building. So you have a month left in the season where you can have full capacity. It doesn't matter if they start winning games now. It does not matter if they have a more competent product on the ice because if a fan base is pissed off because a team is not going to make the playoffs, even though they're playing a bit harder down the stretch, they're not going to show up in April either. And let's get to the hire. They hired Martin St. Louis, which let's just get the cat out of the bag here. This is probably not going to be a popular opinion. It's just, it's the truth. I can't say anything else. Martin St. Louis was hired because he's French. There's, that's it. He has no qualifications. He has no experience. He is the Josh McCowan of the NHL. If you heard, remember me talking earlier in the week, the Houston Texans wanted to hire Josh McCowan, who was coaching his kids high school football last year to be their head coach. Martin St. Louis is doing the exact same thing. He's coaching his children. He doesn't have experience. He speaks French and he's a really good hockey player. Well, just because you are a really good hockey player does not mean you're going to be a great coach. Wayne Gretzky was a terrible coach. He's the greatest player of all time. How many excellent players are great coaches? They're better GMs. Stevie Y, Joe Sackick. They're not behind the bench. Craig Berube, Stanley Cup champion, was no all-star. He was a tough physical player. You don't want to mess with the guy, but he wasn't a stud hockey player. So that's why I look at this and say, Okay, you want to give Martin St. Louis a trial run. Well, where does this team go? Because I've been saying, I don't think this is a long-term rebuild where you have to trade everyone and your scorched earth, your Arizona, your Buffalo. You need to be terrible for five years. Ottawa, you know what I'm talking about here. I don't think that's where they are. Do you have pieces that can still play? that were in the Stanley Cup final less than a year ago. Brennan Gallagher, okay, people don't like him. That makes him. That makes me like him even more if I'm a management of the Montreal Canadiens. Oh, he's a whiner. Oh, he, who cares? He plays hard for you. Josh Anderson, the unicorn. I love him. I'm not trading him. No way. He's far too valuable. There are so few Josh Andersons out there you're not parting with him. You're not trading Suzuki. You're not trading Caulfield. If you believe you could be competitive, you're not trading Carey Price. That's the nucleus of your team. You're not, you're not trading Romanoff. If you do, then Jeff Gordon should be fired. Ken Hughes, whoever else is running the show down there. So why is this a long-term? I don't think it will be. So why Martin St. Louis? Martin St. Louis, all I saw on Twitter last night was, oh, this is a great hire. He's such a good dude. Okay. He might be. He's probably a great person. I could give a shit about how great a person is. Can you coach? We don't know. And this is the problem I have with sports now. You're giving an opportunity to a guy who didn't earn it. This guy hasn't been coaching in the NHL. He's not on the coast. At least Danny Briere has been in the ECHL doing things like this and gets promoted to AGM in Philly. He's earned the stripes. He's been at the lower levels. Martin St. Louis hasn't. And maybe I'm making too much out of this. But you bring him in. Clearly, this is premeditated. Clearly, they're working on this for weeks because – you don't just hire a guy that never played for your organization and uh, all accounts lives in Quebec, whatever. You, you've been talking to him for a little while here. He's coaching tonight, his debut against the Washington Capitals. So you have a team that's terrible, worse than the NHL. Do you expect this team to be good? Are their systems going to improve? So if in their last 30 games, if they win, 10, does that mean he was successful? Does that mean he gets re-upped for next season? 
it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because you're bringing a coach onto a team that is a flat out disaster. It's so hard to evaluate his coaching on a team like this. And furthermore, if he does well, which maybe he would, I guarantee you, Montreal, here's a prediction, they'll win tonight. New coach bump, they'll get a win tonight because it happens every time there's a new coach hired. Unless you take over the Philly job, but Mike Yo was already on the bench, so that stench was already on him. But if St. Louis is successful, do you know what happens? You don't win the lottery. You don't get the first pick. So you have your coach of the future with a team that all likelihood Jeff Gordon doesn't like, and then what? You pick fourth? Why pick fourth when you can pick first? It's simple to me. Ride it out with Ducharme. You don't have to like him. Fire him. End of the year. See you later. Chris Jury waited the year last year. He then fired his coach, David Quinn. Fired him after, after the season. That's totally fine. But why do it this way? I, I see this going. Winning games, if you're a Montreal fan right now, is not positive. Because even the, you know, Let's go through this. Let's look at the standings. They have 23 points. They're 12 points behind Buffalo, which is terrible. But they're only five clear of Arizona. Why? Who cares if you're losing? People can't go in the rink. They can't go in if they wanted to. Canadian government has ratchet straps on seating. You can't go in there. And my biggest problem with this, he hasn't earned this opportunity. And I, I don't love the old boys club. Oh, we got to hire a guy. You know, we just got fired. We got to pick him as our head coach. No, it's lazy. It's a lazy way to hire a coach. However, you don't just hire a guy who's coaching his kids and, and you know, tying their skates yesterday at the Colisee. How about a little experience? How about, how about you look at your organization and say, how can we improve this? It, I'm going to say this again for the, the fifth time this podcast. If Montreal wins games down the stretch, it's not a positive thing. Montreal fans, you should hope they lose every, what's the point of winning? What do you get out of that? Oh, we beat Washington. They're a playoff team. Okay. That's a loser's that's a loser. If you're gonna lose, be the best loser. Get Shane Wright. Develop him. Maybe finally, after 15 years, you'll have a number one center because you haven't had one in forever. I'd rather have that than well, who are we gonna take? Like, uh, it's a weak draft. Uh, after one or two, it's pretty thin. Um well. Do we bring Marty back? I mean, he did a pretty good job. And, oh, he speaks French really well. Um, and, again, hiring a French-speaking coach is not a bad thing. I, It's something Montreal does. I don't think it's smart. And that's not saying that um, bilingual French-speaking coaches aren't competent, aren't, because they are. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is hiring a coach – and having a list of candidates where you see a great one in your face and you don't hire him because he can't speak French is beyond stupid to me. I don't care if my coach is from Bratislava, if he can't speak a lick of English, if he can coach him up, if he can get my team to play harder, to get some W's, I could care less. You bitch about the media already. Give them nothing. You need good articles written about you. Are you that weak-minded? Those Montreal teams in the 90s weren't like that. Patrick Wall wasn't like that. (sighs) 
I, I think Dominic Ducharme is a, he's an assistant coach. That's how I look at him. I don't think he's a leader of men, so to speak. You hear that term in the NFL all the time. I don't believe Dominic, and I'm sure this is so disappointing to him because, you know, being in Halifax, winning a, a Memorial Cup, goes to Drummondville, gets the uh, assistant coach job in Montreal, and you know he's going to be elevated eventually because he speaks French. Eventually he does. I'm sure he thought he'd be here five, ten years. And quite frankly, I think his next job will be in the queue for a team in Quebec because I don't think he wants to leave the area all that much. And I'm interested to see his career trajectory now because he's gone through the Montreal circuit. Now, they will recycle coaches. They hired Michel Therrien twice for what, whatever reason. Language. Uh, because it sure, certainly wasn't because of his coaching prowess because he had none of that. But I don't know. I don't feel bad for the guy because you make your own bed. The team didn't play hard in front of you. But are the, is these players being rejuvenated? It's February. They played 45. You've played already half your season. You played no, lights out the last half. You're not making the playoffs. You're only decreasing your draft pick. In, in its value. You could pick fourth instead of first. Maybe you rise, you picking second instead. Give yourself the best chance. You were in a Stanley Cup last year. You gave yourself a window to be terrible. People can dunk on you. Least fans will make fun. What, who cares? You were in a Stanley Cup final. You and the Vancouver Canucks and the Montreal Canadiens in the last decade are the only teams that could say that they did it from Canada. You can look at the Oilers. You can wave to them. You can wave to the Leafs. You can wave to the Flames. Wave to the Senators. Because they didn't do it. You did. I'm interested to see what Marty St. Louis does. But when it comes to Montreal, I find it very hard to believe. I find it hard to process in my brain how the last less than half of this season, how Martin St. Louis can earn a long-term extension because the team is no good. And if the team gets better, he'll earn an extension because, and you lose your draft capital in all likelihood, unless the ping pong balls fall your way because you're hosting the draft. Maybe the spirits, the NHL draft lottery will fall upon the Montreal Canadiens in a home draft unless COVID says no capacity and Gary Bettman will send it to Columbus. But this is be why him is my question. Martin St. Louis is a Hall of Famer, first ballot, great player, Stanley Cup champion, hard trophy winner. But he doesn't have any experience behind the bench. He didn't earn this opportunity. He, why wasn't Luke Richardson given the job for the rest of the year? Luke Richardson's on the staff. He couldn't get the job. Alex Burroughs speaks French. He's been on the bench the last three years. Why wasn't Alex Burroughs named the interim head coach? Why was it Martin St. Louis? Because he played in New York and Jeff Gordon was there? Maybe. Is that why? It's puzzling to me. But if I'm Alex Burroughs, if I'm Luke Richardson, I'm pissed off today because this young pup who has been running drills for, for his kids is now a head coach of a hockey team with zero experience, zero background knowledge, and we know nothing about his coaching ability. Other than the fact that he's a Hall of Fame hockey player, which doesn't mean anything when it comes to success, and he can speak French. That's what we know. Anyway, 
I, I, I think it's, it's a really questionable decision. Dominic Ducharme was not the coach of the future. He was never going to be. Jeff Gordon was going to fire him eventually. I thought I'd be at the end of the year, which I'm fine with because that's, he's the GM. He deserves to hire his own coach. But if you bring in Marcus St. Louis for 40 games, he doesn't like it or he does great. He's your next coach. That's who you're hitching your wagon to. A guy with no experience. Head coaches don't have to be retreads. They don't have to be the 60 year old. You know, it doesn't have to be a Bruce Boudreaux who has to come in. However, I do think you should, you should be coaching somewhere and it shouldn't be little kids. You have to earn your stripes. That's just my opinion. I learned a long time ago, you're not given things in life, you earn them. And I just don't think Marty St. Louis earned this opportunity. Also today, the Edmonton Oilers made a coaching change of their own. And I fully expected to come on the podcast today and talk about the Oilers last two games. And I watched the Oilers Blackhawks start to finish last night. And the Oilers were quite pathetic. They had no jump. They had no energy. And the most clear example of why the head coach, Dave Tippett, was fired, in my opinion, is Connor McDavid. First two games back, you could have told me Connor McDavid did not dress because he looks uninterested. He looks unmotivated. He looks irritated. Like he does not want to be at the rink. He just has no jump. He has no fervor. He has no fire in his belly to go out there and compete. And we're talking about the best player on the planet. And he was doing this before the All-Star break. He was, to quote a media member in Edmonton, pissy before the All-Star break, before all this. And he gets interviewed. He seems agitated. He, And I get it. You're asked the same question over and over again. But his play has been pretty pathetic lately as well. He has not been, he's not scoring goals. He's not making an impact. And I haven't, you know, they've already moved to Vander Kane off his line. They don't have a connection. So it's one thing to lose to, it's one thing to say, well, Edmonton has bad goaltending, which they do. But two games, they have, they score one goal. You're not, you're not winning scoring one goal. You have dry silo McDavid, all these players on your roster, they can't buy a goal. And so what, what do they do? Well, it's cliche. It's a team that Ken Holland's put together. I pointed out the whole season. I don't think it's a very good hockey team. I think the depth is there to quote LeBron James top heavy is bleep. They have superstar talent with below average reserves with journeymen like shore, like tourists guys that, quite frankly, can't play hockey anymore. Not an NHL level anyway. Goaltending, that's old and inconsistent and injury prone. The defense, that leaves something to be desired. So you throw all of that together. Then you have a team that's really not playing hard for their coach with all the deficiencies that I just pointed out. It's not a recipe for success. It's not a team that's going to win very many games. So Ken Holland, who is at fault for this team being this porous, fires the coach. Okay. You got your one bullet, Ken Holland. And what I'm most curious about is will Calgary ownership, sorry, will Edmonton ownership be Calgary? Or New York. And what I'm saying about this is Calgary had a, a competent, good, good team that won games, occasionally made the playoffs, were always in the thick of it. And they allowed Brad Tree leaving to keep his job. And to his credit, the Calgary Flames are playing at a very high level this season. Dominated last night. My guy, Matthew Kachuk, is a human wrecking ball. Johnny Goodrow is playing good hockey. They're making things happen. But in my humble opinion, 
Brad Tree Living could have been fired two years ago. This team might be better than they are right now. Calgary could still get bounced in the first round. Is Tree, Tree, uh, Tree Living worth sticking around with after firing five coaches? I don't think so. Or do they go the New York model? Or you got one bullet. You're firing a coach, but if you still stink come the end of the year and you put in a new one, you're gone too. Because that's what the Rangers have done forever. They don't keep you around. You're struggling? See ya. We don't got time for you. It, or even Vegas. They fire coaches like it's nobody's business. Gerard Gallant was successful. See you later. So I'm interested to see where the Oilers are. Because Ken Holland had a great run in Detroit. Won cups. Made some great draft picks. Well, let's just face it. He's an older, he's an older gentleman. This team is top heavy as bleed. It has, I don't even think it's underperformed because I just don't think the roster is that good. Not to mention you're in the weakest division in the NHL. If you had to pick a division, I'd pick the Pacific. Definitely not the Atlantic. The Atlantic is the top four, top four or five teams in that division are top. After that, yeah, it gets real weak. Montreal, Buffalo, Detroit, sure. But do you want to play Florida? Do you want to play Tampa? Do you want to play Toronto five times a year? I don't. I'd rather play LA. I'd rather play Anaheim. I'd rather play San Jose, Arizona. But to me, there's going to be an impasse here. Because let's think of some of Ken Holland's moves. Okay. How about re-signing Zach Cassian for over two and a half million a year? Bad contract. He's not a good player. He can't play anymore. He's a, he doesn't give you anything. He doesn't skate as good as he used to. And you give him a big contract if you're replaced with Connor. He, he was never that good of a player. I'm sorry. Dreisaitl was signed before he got there. He gets no credit for that. Cody CC, multi-year deal. Terrible deal. He's not a top four defenseman. To me, I like Warren Fogel. He's a good player. But I'd rather have Ethan Bear because the defense, as bad as some of the forwards are, is worse. I love Darnell Nurse. He played 30 minutes last night. 30 minutes, played half the game. But William Laggettson. Duncan Keith, another trade that has not worked out. CC, re-signing Tyson Berry. Evan Bouchard playing meaningful minutes is a mistake in my opinion, but sure, Derek Ryan. Re-signing Nugent Hopkins for that number is a mistake. He's got six goals. Yes, he's almost a point for a game, but he's got, you got to have more than six goals. I'm sorry. Somebody's got to finish on this team other than McDavid and Dreisel. They don't. Dave Tippett can take the bullet because you can say, well, Dave Tippett plays defensive hockey. You got two of the most, two of the, uh, two of the players with the most firepower in the NHL. True. He's a defense, he's a defensive minded coach. He plays a system. But you look around and say, okay, you want me to play a defensive game? You want me to, play a shot you want me to build a team that's built around your coach or if that's not who you want as your head coach fire him and bring in the coach that will do it go hire mike babcock he's free he's available i doubt the players would like it but you know he'll play your system you'll play that system because you did it for over a decade but you say dave Tippett says this is how i coach this is how my teams are built i expect this okay well well, I don't know. Let's see. So we're going to play really solid defensively. Okay. Well, I'm going to go get an aging Duncan Keith. Wow. That, it, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that should work. Uh, I'm going to play Evan Bouchard, who is an offensive only defenseman because he just is a disaster. He's going to play meaningful minutes on this team. Makes sense to me. Uh, William Legison. Yeah, he was in Sweden last year, but yeah, we like him. No problem. Yeah. Uh, Tyson Berry, he's kind of like Bouchard, but, you know, he, he'll take risks and we have people that will cover for him, right? Oh, yeah, yeah no problem. 
Okay. We got Darnell Nurse. I love him, which I do. Which they, yeah, yeah, no problem. Check. We love him. But you look at their defense. Other than Nurse, who's a who's a great shot? Who's great defensively on this on this defense on this decor? I'll end the suspense. No one. No one. That's how Dave Tippett plays. He plays a defensive-minded brand of hockey. You could think it's boring. I don't care. That's how he plays. You have to know your audience, know your coach, and say, maybe we have a different point of view on how to build a team. And that could be ownership saying, well, maybe Ken Holland isn't the guy for us to hire. We should go hire somebody else because he's not going to want to do it the way Dave Tippett does, or we have to choose between the two. Those are internal decisions that have to happen. Internal discussions that need to happen. But you say, okay, well, we got this defense school. Well, that's pretty god awful. It's gonna be tough to play my system at, for Dave Tippett. We need an excellent goalie. Maybe we can counteract some of these deficiencies. Okay. Well, you see, before Peter Shirelli left, we let him sign Miko Koskinen. Okay, don't love that. Don't love that, but. You know what? Maybe we could trade him. We throw in a sweetener, but Mike Smith's contracts up after last year. Yes, he played great, but he's 40 bleeping years old. Oh, I, I think he's going to have a same season he had this year. Was he Tom Brady? So not only do you sign into a one-year extension, you give him a second year. He signed, he's under contract next year at 41. So you have a GM that didn't address the defense, has terrible bottom end of the lineup, and two goalies that are out to lunch. How is that the coach's fault? Ken Allen, at the end of this season, and I don't like people to lose their job, but when it's your problem, when you're the one that did this, yes, Connor and Leon haven't been playing that well lately. That's 100% the truth. They need to own that. And they haven't really. They've been pissy about it but at the same time if they have an off night you're losing because nobody else brings anything to the table Yamamoto has been disappointing I like Pugliari but he hasn't been that good Vander Kane has chemistry with no one so far they got to give him more time but still and I just look around and say what does this team have that's positive, other than McDavid and Dreisaitl. But if this continues and Ken Holland is not fired at the end of the season, there's something wrong in the NHL. Because I, I agree that GM should be given three to five years, but he knew taking over, this is a different job. You're taking over a team that he saw as a team that could get to a Stanley Cup. He did nothing to help this team get better. Nothing. Resign Darnell Nurse. Bully for you. Other than that, what, what has worked that he's done? Nothing. Nothing. So Jay Woodcroft, it's a new, he's going to change things? It's the same shitty lineup that's been there all year. They can trade for a goalie, which Cole McDonald and I talked about last week. Yes, it's, it's, it's a good idea to trade for a goalie. But, you know, Mark andre Fleury, is he going to be a game changer? He's 38 years old. He's not what he used to be. He runs out of gas in the playoffs. We saw it in Vegas the last couple of years. He doesn't have the stamina that he once had. And he had Petrangelo, Shea Theodore, competent defensemen playing in front of him in Vegas. He has Louis, Joe, and Paul in front of him in Edmonton. I, this team is not at fault because of its coach. And I, I think Dave Tippett's taking, obviously a fire, he's taking the wrath today. But Connor McDavid's a leader of this team. And it looks like he's quit on the team. I just call it as I see it. He looks like he's quit on this roster. He looks like he's defeated. Like he's not, he doesn't present a front that's like, I want to go play tonight. He needs to come back rejuvenated because it's the only chance this team has. And again, the reason they have a chance 
It's because they play in this dog of a division. It's the worst in the NHL. I mean, look at it. You have Seattle, Vancouver, San Jose. You have 49 points. You're four behind, you're five behind Calgary, who, have, who has a game in hand, but you're you have four games in hand on Anaheim, Vegas, and three on LA. And you're only five behind each of them. So you could make a run. You have better players than LA and Anaheim. You should catch them. San Jose should, is not a good hockey team. You should beat, you have a lot of games against these teams down the stretch. And that doesn't mean this team's good. It's just pointing out their schedule down the stretch here. But Edmonton has way deeper problems, way bigger, way more concrete problems than Dave Tippett. Dave Tippett is taking the wrath of Ken Holland's incompetence and Ken Holland's inability to build a roster that is championship, that is playoff worthy. I don't expect Derek Ryan, Devin Shore, Kyle Turris to turn it around because they haven't all year. And they're not good NHL players anymore. Do I expect Mike Smith to go on it? I don't. The odds of, if I had to, if it was betting today and you said, Mike Smith's going to have a 925 save percentage the rest of the year, or Mike Smith's going to injure his hamstring tomorrow. I'm betting on the hamstring because that's what we know about him. He's a 40 year old goaltender. It's not his fault. He's older. He's had a lot of wear on those tires and he lets in a lot of shaky goals when he is in the net. This team will not win a playoff round. I don't think they're going to make the playoffs. Jay Woodcroft can go in, rah raw speech, try to change the momentum of this team, but they still have the fundamental flaws that are at the forefront of the general manager. That is the biggest problem. Not head coach, not systems. The two bigger, two biggest problems are the leadership when it comes to McDavid and their general manager and the roster construction. Not Dave Tippett and Jim Playfair, who were let go today. Also in the NHL, a couple suspensions. Marcus Foligno was given a two-game uh, suspension for kneeing um, during a fight the other night against the Winnipeg Jets. I'm okay with that. Uh, I'm not going to go in too deep into that suspension. I don't see it as a huge problem. However, there's a suspension that was handed out to a Boston Bruins player that I have a massive problem with. And that would be, of course, Brad Marchand, who has a long history with the NHL player safety, has been suspended three times, fined four. Um, the guy is known around the league as a rat, as a dirty player. And I'm not going to debunk those notions, those qualms about him. He has licked Leo Komarov, which was disgusting, which was uncalled for, which is not part of the game. He, he does stuff that would irritate you, of course. He has a high hit every now and then. But he's also one of the best players in the world, and there's no disputing that. But the other night, he's going toe-to-toe with Tristan Jari uh, against uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins. And at one point, he gets his high stick right in his grill, and that was a high sticking penalty. It was nothing more. And later in the game, the game's going on. You can tell there's a lot of chirping. He reaches across the bow and gives Tristan Jari a little punch on the chin. It was not a hard punch. It was not a Superman punch. It wasn't George LaRock coming over the top on George Peros. Oddly enough, George Peros, the head of department player safety, which I'll get to in a minute. But he did give him a shot. And after the game, all I hear is he's going to be suspended a lot. And it blows my mind that not only that he was suspended for this, but it was six games. And what this illustrates to me is the NHL is a bigger issue. And I'm pointing to goaltending. And what I mean by this is 
Aaron Dell was handed a three game suspension. When he cut off the edge of Drake Batherson, he went crashing into the boards. And Drake Batherson likely might be out for the rest of the season, going to miss a large chunk for the, of the rest, having a career year, miss the All-Star game. Could give a crap about that, but he is having a career year. Would have been an experience nonetheless. And Aaron Dell gets three games. But what, what's who cares? It's Aaron Dell, right? But goalies are as guilty of being dirty, of being mouthy, and what the problem I see here is, in the past, if you had a rat on your team, if you had a guy that just mouth, 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 you had a big player that would come across the boards and shut them the hell up. Matt Cook was a rat. I think he's one of the dirtiest hockey players to ever play. But guess what? If he crossed the line, a guy would jump over the boards and kick his ass and grab him. And even if he didn't want to drop the gloves, he'd know the rest of the game. Maxine Lapierre learned the hard way. Stop fucking around. Well, there's, there's really little of that anymore. There's more rat. There's more chirping with no vindication, with nobody being able to retaliate, be able to defend themselves or their teammates because of the PC world that we live in. And there shouldn't be three fights every night. But if a player is mouthy, can go the whole game running his mouth, like Tristan Jari was the other night, because I watched the entire game. He didn't shut up. And I've heard the whole year complaints about this guy, how he's dirty, how he tries to take up a player's skates. And not only that, but he doesn't shut the hell up. And he says stuff that he probably shouldn't be saying. But goalies are protected because you can't go in the crease. You can't hit them. You can't do anything. So you just have to sit there and take it. Well, I have a problem with that. Marshan deserves the right to do something if Tristan Jari is crossing a line. If he's being a – Brad Marshan should get pummeled when he does something really dirty. P.K. Subban should have his head beaten when he slew foots a guy and ends their season like he did to Sammy Blay, like he did to Ryan Reeves. That's 100% yes. Beat the hell out of him because he deserved it. Tristan Jari as a goalie knows he can't be touched. So it's like he's sitting in this force field of Star Wars saying whatever the hell comes to his mind, and he knows eh, nobody can touch me. That's a bad precedent. In life, if somebody knows they can do anything without any sort of repercussion, how bad do you think our world would be? People think it's going up in smoke right now. If you can act without, and here's my my correlation, and this one is way worse, but I'm, it just came to mind. The Washington football team owner, Dan Snyder, is an awful human being. He's been accused of sexual assault multiple times. He still owns the team. Roger Goodell finally is saying we're looking into it. Before, he acted however he wanted to. He was misogynistic. He was arrogant. He, he was completely offside. Women were afraid to work for this guy. And this is way worse of an example, but Trist, you're allowing Tristan Jari to melt. You're allowing goalies. I, I just see goalies that get away with the world. You nudge them. It's a two minute penalty or it's a fight. You have to fight a guy because a goalie got in your way. His fat ass couldn't get the hell out of the way. That shouldn't be the case. I said this forever. And I can, if a goalie is out of the crease and he has the puck, you should be able to hit him. They do it in Germany. I've seen it. If he has the puck, you hit him square in the chest. That's a, that should be 100% allowed because it's a clean hit. He's got the puck. And, you know, what? maybe he'll get you. Maybe he lays you good on the goalie. But you want to come out of your net? Look up, buddy boy, because I'm coming through you. And I hope I knock in the middle of next week because it all this does is the suspension of Brad Marchand gives Tristan Jari more room, more time to run his mouth, to be an irritant, to be a to, And it's less about being an irritant, but you're, you're being an asshole the whole game and you can't retaliate. That's stupid to me. Is Brad Marchand a perfect human? No, he's a dirty player at times. But I'll tell you this, Brad Marchand is a way better hockey player than Tristan Jari will ever think of being. Brad Marchand is going to the Hall of Fame. Tristan Jari 
is still trying to be a number one goaltender in this league. Brad Marchand's a Stanley Cup champion. He gets six games. I thought this was the NHL was a league where we protect our stars. It's about putting the talent on the field, on the on the ice, night in, night out. We want you to be able to watch Crosby, Ovechkin, McDavid, Marshan. Nobody is tuning in to see Tristan Jari. Nobody cares about Tristan Jari. You like watching the Boston Bruins? Even if you hate them, Brad Marchand's interesting. Kane's Bruins tonight. Good game. I'd rather see Brad Marchand on the ice because he's an interesting player to watch. He's a really good hockey player. Again, he's going to the bleeping Hockey Hall of Fame. Tristan Jari is in the Hall of Very Good. He's a, he's a very good goaltender. He's not a Hall of Famer. May never win a Stanley Cup. May never win a fucking playoff round. And he gets the special treatment just because he's in that little net protected by the force field of goalie pads and a blocker. So they can slash guys. They can hit them with a blocker when you tr- when you whack their glove when it's closed. And they get no penalties for that. You give them one little knock on the side of the head. You're out six games. Are you kidding me? George Peros is the head of player safety. The guy was an enforcer. It's what I find so, but yes, the game is so much safer than it used to be. Brad Marchand's play was not an intent to injure. His shit is more disgusting, the stuff he does, when it comes to licking, when it comes to him, you know, squirting water, whatever. He he didn't try to hurt Tristan Jari. A six-game suspension should be where a guy is out multiple weeks. Tristan Jari's playing tonight in Ottawa. I believe that Sidney Crosby's going for goal number 500. Tristan Jari's going to be in the net tonight. Oh, I guess the Smith's starting. Oh, okay, well, whatever. Either He could be starting tonight, but he's not. Why not? Oh, because I guess we really don't know. Because optics? Because this is just infuriating me. If the NHL, if you're about stars, if you're about protecting the stars, protecting the shield, keeping our best players on the ice, then do that. Don't be hypocritical. Brad Marchand is a better hockey player than Tristan Jarrett, point blank and the period. There's no debate about that. There's no conversation. There's no, well, well, maybe Jarrett. No, no. Why? Also, if this was such a big deal, if this was an intent to injure play. Don't you think one member of the Pittsburgh Penguins would have did something? They didn't. 87, Mr. Tough Guy, Sidney Crosby, is on the ice. Didn't even look at Brad. He'll fight every now and then. Everybody says how tough he is, such a great competitor. Wouldn't you think Sidney Crosby dropped the gloves, do something to retaliate in that instance? No, he probably went and whined to the ref and wanted an extra two minutes, but nevertheless. He didn't think it was a big deal. Maybe he doesn't want to take out his workout buddy in the summer, but you could, you could point to Brian Dumoulin and say, go get him, big boy. This is your time now. No, nobody did a thing. This was a throwaway play that is now a six-game suspension. Then he chose lucky the Boston Bruins, who likely would make the playoffs. I don't think they're going to have a, a deep run, which I'll touch on in a minute, but this is stupid. He's going to miss six games. Goalies are overprotected. They're coddled. They're like little, little babies. Just came out of the womb. We can't have anybody touch the goalie. Oh, you need hand sanitizer before you touch the baby. (sighs) Boston Bruins also had news yesterday. Tuka Rask has announced his retirement from the NHL after 15 seasons. The 34-year-old is you know one of the best Boston Bruins of all time you could say he had a great career uh 34 he was trying to attempting a comeback but he had he had off-season hip surgery he's had complications returning to the net and he decided to retire to you know rather than put further risk on his on his long-term health and you know a couple different topics here um I think the Boston Bruins are a good hockey team. 
but I don't think they're a Stanley Cup contender. And this really shut the door on that. As much as I have my personal beefs with Tuka Rask, which I'll touch on, um, he's an excellent goaltender. He's gotten to a team to a Stanley Cup final. This team has the utmost confidence in him. And now you look and you have Linus Allmark, who they hope can be their goaltender of the future, and Jeremy Swayman, who is a backup. And you love Marchand when he's available to play. Pasternak's a stud, one of my favorites. Bergeron's still playing at high level. Um, you know, Charlie Coyle leaves something to be desired. They have some good players, but they're not. I look at Boston. I don't trust their goaltending. I don't think their defense score is strong enough. Jake DeBrusque is still on this roster despite requesting a trade seemingly like five months ago. And I, I just look at their division. I, I don't think they're better than Toronto. I don't think they're better than Tampa. I don't think they're better than Florida. I don't think they're better than Carolina. I don't believe they're better than the Rangers. So there's five teams I could name off. I do think they'll make the playoffs. But with this retirement, with the roster the way it is, it's not going to improve that vastly before the playoffs. At least I don't see it happening. I think this team is in, it, is in an interesting position because I'm sure they're saying we're going to put the chips all in, which maybe they'll go out and trade for a goaltender or a big name player. I think um, Joe Pavelski would be an interesting guy to see if he could land in Beantown. Um, I, he's got a big salary. You have to make that money work, but I think he'd fit extremely well. They have a history of, of good veteran trades at the deadline. And Ginla worked out. Rick Nash worked out for a while in Boston. Uh, Yarmir Yager played very, uh, played very well for the bees. Uh, so I think Pavelski would be an interesting if they wanted to see if they could make a run, but I don't expect this team to be in the Stanley cup conversation. And I think this retirement really put, put that notion to bed. And now uh, I'm interested to see where this team goes. You have Marchand, you have Bergeron's on the last year of his deal. If I had to say today, I think we'll, at, by the end of 2022, Bergeron and Rass will both be retired. I think this is Bergeron's last year in the NHL. I think he can still play, but does Boston want to bring him back? Does he want to play elsewhere? And I think, you know, he's got a lot of hardware. He's won a Stanley Cup. He's won, you know, so many Selkies. I believe this is his last year in the league. Now, Tuka Rask, I'm sure the, the conversation will be, is Tuka Rask a Hall of Famer? And to me, he isn't. Um, I Obviously, he's a great goaltender. One of the worst trades that Toronto Maple Leafs ever made, trading Andrew Raycroft for Tuka Rask. Um, but... I have a beef with Tuka Rask and I'll always have this beef with him. And I think it should keep him out of the hockey hall of fame. And you, if you are a fan of me, you've heard this before. And if you're a parent, I'm sure you disagree with me, but I'm going to reiterate my stance. Nonetheless, two years ago in the bubble, we're coming back. No hockey from March till July. COVID's going around. People are freaking out the start of the mass hysteria. And, but we got through it. We're coming back. We're going to the bubble. It's safe. It's, it's a great environment. No fans, but you're not going to get COVID. You're not going to get everything's fine. So you're into the bubble. Bruins are playing. They win, they win the first round. Then all of a sudden we hear, well, Tukaras is checking out of the bubble. Okay. And he's going home to his kids. Okay. But we didn't hear that they were really sick. We didn't hear anything about a family problem. After the fact, we didn't hear anything either. See, he doesn't have to disclose his personal information, but it, it wasn't received that way from Boston Bruins fans. It also didn't seem to be received that way from management that were really unclear, that were really not so on board with Tuka Rask and his decision. So that told me something. But he left. Left his team high and dry. They With Yaroslav Halak, the back of goalie, they lose in five games to Carolina. They're done. Sorry to Tampa Bay. Losing five games to Tampa Bay. They're out. Sayonara. Hasta la vista. So now you're left looking, well, what really happened to Tuka Rask? Was his kid sick? What really happened? To me, he wanted to get out of the bubble. He couldn't handle it. He wanted to go see his kids. Okay, you were with your kids for five months. Okay. I don't know. Can handle three weeks away. Other guys did it. Everybody has kids. They went to the boat. They fought through it. 
But I look at this and say, Tugaras quit on his team. I, have a, I find it very hard to put somebody in the Hockey Hall of Fame that they gave up on their team. I have a hard time putting him in the, in the Hall of Fame, in the class, in, a, in the same room with a guy like Jerome McGinley, with a guy like Joe Sackett, with a guy like Steve Eisenman, Yarmir Yager, you know, the greats that would never have done it. Because they would have said, you know, we're, we're finishing this. I don't, we're, we're, okay, I love my kids, but I'll see you soon. I have a job to do. This is what I do for a living. He quit on his team. That will be my opinion forever. And, you know, the Hall of Fame isn't everything to everyone. It's important to me. And he shouldn't be rewarded. He shouldn't be in that with that group of people because of that. He should be penalized and he shouldn't be in. That might not be a popular opinion. I'm sure I'm not. I'm, I'm not a big, the goalie community likely hates me today, which I'm fine with, come at me, but that's just my stance. Can't go three weeks without seeing your kids grow up. Maybe you're the child. I mean, a lot happened in the NHL over the last 24 or 48 hours. I mean, there's still news trickling in. I mean, the NBA trade deadline was today, but the NHL, is going tonight. The Canadian men uh, at the Olympics win today, 5-1. Uh, you know, big, big win for them to start the tournament. They play the Americans tomorrow. The Americans won 8-0 against China. I'm looking forward to watching the Americans play, oddly enough, more than, than Team Canada, because they're so young. They, you know, they don't know any better, if you will. Their average age is 22 and a half. And I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing what, what they bring, how they, what kind of system they play, and just some of the young players that we could see in the, in the NHL in the not-too-distant future. But today is the NBA trade deadline. And Seamus, Fillmore, and I ch chatted about the other night talking about potential, potential deal. And we talked about, we talked about um, the – the Brooklyn Nets situation, who at that point had lost eight in a row. They dropped their ninth in a row on, on Tuesday night to the Celtics, losing by 37 points. James Harden missed his fourth straight game. Kevin Durant's been out for a while. Kyrie Irving can only play road games. And I said, James Harden, who's 33, out of shape, great guard, but diminishing returns. He's only getting older. He doesn't take care of himself well enough. Brooklyn should move him for Ben Simmons. I believe Ben Simmons, who's 25, yes, he can't shoot. Maybe he'll come back a better shooter than we last remembered him in Philly. He is going to fit well with Kyrie and with Kevin Durant because he can be a de facto center, a de facto power, uh, power forward where he can pass from out of the paint. He can still be a ball handler, if you will, but his options are – I got Kevin Durant from three, who's lethal, the best scorer in the NBA. I have Kyrie Irving, who can knock, up, knock down shots. We have so much depth, and we are – I don't have to be – people don't get to say, well, why isn't Ben shooting? Ben's distributing. Ben's getting rebounds. He's in the paint, dominating down low. He had to leave after last year in Philly where uh, Coach uh, Doc Rivers said, I'm not sure if we can win a title with Ben Simmons, and his free throw shooting was so porous. That, that marriage is over. Him and Joel Embiid had just had enough of one another, and he has not played a single minute, single second this season for the Philadelphia 76ers. But there was a move made. There was a deal that got done. And the deal is as follows. The Brooklyn Nets traded James Harden and Paul Millsap going to Philly for Ben Simmons, Seth Curry, Andre Drummond, and two first-round draft picks going to Brooklyn. Brooklyn will receive Philadelphia's unprotected 22 first-round pick with the right to defer it to 2023, as well as a top eight protected 2027 first-round pick. So basically two firsts, and Brooklyn gets Ben Simmons, who is a four-time All-Star, Seth Curry, who's one of the best three-point shooters in the NBA, and they get 
Andre Drummond with two first round picks. Andre Drummond is a prototypical center. He rebounds, he runs the floor hard. And, you know, he played, he came off the bench well for Philly, but I, I like the fit because Brooklyn is a small team. They don't have a big that is a prototypical big. They don't have a guy that just grabs rebounds. DeAndre Jordan's not in the roster anymore. That's not Blake Griffin's game. Uh, you look, you, uh, Nicholas Claxton is not that player. So they were without a big on their roster. So I think this trade is better for Brooklyn. Now, in the short term, I'm not sure if Ben Simmons is going to be able to play right away. He hasn't played in forever. I do think he's going to play this year. He's out of Philly. I don't see why he wouldn't. Brooklyn needs to right the ship. Kevin Durant coming back is paramount. He's the best player in the world. They need him to come back. They need him to be healthy. So that's first and foremost. There's always the worry about Kyrie Irving. He's not going to get vaccinated unless they change the rules in Brooklyn where he can play road games. There's a concern there. But they are in eighth in the, in the East right now. They would be in a playing game against the Celtics if the season ended today. But if Kevin Durant, if Kyrie Irving, and if um, Ben Simmons are playing, I like Brooklyn a hell of a lot more than I like the Celtics. And I do think they can improve down the stretch here. They have the Wizards tonight losing nine in a row. We'll see if they can win that game. But I like it for Brooklyn way more. And I think it could be for the short term and the long term. You get draft picks, but Brooklyn, you, you look, you say, okay, you get Seth Curry. He's automatically in your starting lineup. He's a three-point shooter. He can spread the floor. And Seth Curry is a better basketball player than Joe Harris. Joe Harris is a same type player as, as Seth Curry. He's a three-point shooter. He is a better defender. But last year in the playoffs, he shot 22% from three. He's been out for the majority of the year. But you could go, I look at the lineup. Patty Mills can likely come off the bench. You get Kyrie Irving. You get Seth Curry. You get Kevin Durant. You have Ben Simmons. And then I likely throw a Benbury or a, um, or a uh, Nicholas Claxton in that starting lineup. Or you could throw Drummond out there for more size, depending on, on the matchup of your team. I think it's a pretty good roster. Now, Philadelphia has been playing fantastic this year. Sons Ben Simmons. You know, they currently sit fifth in the East, but they're only two and a half games out of first. They're only uh, half a game out of third. So they're right there. They lost to the Suns the other night. They, they, are, uh, they are hosting the, uh, the Thunder on Friday. So, you know, I, I like their team a lot. Joel Embiid is likely the MVP of the league right now. I like Tyrese Maxey. They didn't have to trade Bible, which is something I thought they might have to do. So I, I do like that they didn't have to give up their best piece, in my opinion, other than Joel Embiid, of course. So, you know, James Harden and Embiid should play well together. And you still, like I said, you still have Tyrese Maxey. You still have Bible. You have a deep bench with this team. But... Like I said, James Harden is not the same player he used to be. Maybe he'll come in rejuvenated, but every time he gets moved, he's been traded twice in the last two years. Left, complained about Houston, gets moved to Brooklyn. Complained about Brooklyn, now he's in Philly back with Daryl Morey, who was his GM in Houston back in the day. So I like Philly's roster. The East is stacked. I think it's going to be a really interesting race down the stretch because Miami Heat are likely didn't make a move today. I don't believe I'm still they're still updating trades, but I don't think they made a move. Uh, but they didn't have to. They have a really deep roster. The Bulls are, are a really good team. They beat Charlotte last night. They've made their moves. Uh, you know, we go through these teams. Toronto, they traded away Goran Dragic, which was expected. He hasn't played in you know since October. Uh, the Celtics traded away Dennis Schroeder. To reacquire Daniel Tice, who they traded away last year. Um, so that was kind of a puzzling trade. We got um, the Wizards added Christoph Porzingis from the Mavericks for Spencer Dinwiddie and Davis Bertans. But this is a, a weird trade because the, the Wizards are likely going to miss the playoffs. Um, it, it's, it's just it's a weird it's a weird day. Uh, the Celtics also traded Josh Richardson, who's a great defender, kind of a 3 and D guy for Derek White. Derek White is a good player. Uh, you know, they, they, they're they similar in what they do, 
well, we got to make wait and see um, what what happens here. Um, but I I think both these teams, the 76ers and the Nets, despite big pieces leaving and entering their organizations, still have a good opportunity to go to the NBA Finals. I still like Milwaukee the most of the teams in the East because I think Giannis proved it last year he can play. They, they've got the Suns tonight, which should be a great matchup, rematch of the finals last year. Um, Chris Middleton, they still got Drew Holiday. Uh, Giannis, Bobby Portis is playing out of his mind. The guy's playing so well. Despite not having Brooke Lopez the entire season, they crushed the Lakers the other night. But you look, okay, Bobby Portis, Middleton, Anta DeCumpo, Drew Holiday, Grayson Allen's a great player. Pat Connaughton knows his role. Wesley Matthews, a strong, tough defender. But you could say, well, what, what are they missing? What is this team missing? Well, who, who is their P.J. Tucker, who's their lockdown defender? Is a, really, you know, a good defensive player who can run the floor. Well, today they traded Dante DiVincenzo, who's a good player, who didn't get to play last year in the postseason. He got injured in the second round, so they won a title without him. He's leading the organization. They're bringing in Serge Ibaka from the Clippers. And Ibaka is not as good as P.J. Tucker is right now, but Ibaka is a tough defender. He will rebound. And if a team wants to go into the paint against Milwaukee, it's going to be virtually impossible because they have Giannis who will block anything you come at. You know, he had two blocks in the first three possessions the other night. Bobby Portis can defend. And now you have Serge Ibaka, who will likely come off the bench, play with the second unit. He's better than Greg Monroe. He's an upgrade over Greg Monroe. Brooke Lopez will come back. He can also guard. So I, I think Milwaukee is the best defensive team. They have the best player in the Eastern Conference. And Giannis, uh, they have one of the best players in the East behind Kevin Durant and Giannis Antetokounmpo. And I, I just don't see who can beat this team with the way they're put together. So, but I, I think the East is so fascinating. In the NBA, it's normally the West that is way more compelling. It's the complete opposite right now. When I look at the NBA, how it's set up, Milwaukee, really good. Miami, really good. Chicago's a good team. The Cavaliers continue to win. Philly got better today. Toronto, I don't think they got better today. I wouldn't love it if I was a Raptors fan, what they did today when it comes to the trade deadline. They didn't really do anything. Boston, trade awesome assets. Brooklyn, it's a it's wait and see for them. Did they get better? I think they long term. I think they did, and maybe we won't see the fruits of that labor this year, but in the long term, I believe we will. We're out west. I look Phoenix dominant. Golden State very good team. Memphis, I think Memphis can scare some people, but after that, I don't trust Utah. Dallas traded Porzingis. I mean, I'm sure Dallas would say we got better in that trade. Um. I don't, love, I don't love Porzingis at all. Doncic is a star. Finney Smith's a good player. But that doesn't really improve their team. Denver, Jamal Murray hasn't played yet. I, you got to wait and see. I mean, Denver could be dangerous. Jokic is great. Porter Jr. to come back, maybe. Minnesota, too young. Clippers, not enough talent. The Lakers, to believe, uh, you know, not, not happening. So out east that's where the battle whoever comes out of the east is going to be beat up they're gonna to have to go through a war so oddly enough the Suns, the the warriors may be in prime position just get past one another and you get to the finals you might have to play milwaukee but they might be so depleted from getting through the rest of the eastern conference that you are in a better position to kind of pick the carcass of the team that to go through war to get to that spot but there might be more trades coming in. We'll talk about more of that tomorrow, but interesting day in the NBA. Um, like I said, finals rematch tonight. You have Leafs Flames tonight. Um, Leafs have won six in a row. Flames come off a 6 nothing drubbing of the Vegas Golden Knights last night. That should be a fun game. Brad Marchand serving the first game of his six-game six game suspension tonight against the Hurricanes. Uh, Craig Brube was signed. We'll preview the Canadian men's uh, Olympic match a game tomorrow against the against the Americans. So lots happening. And like I said, uh, Adam Beers will be joining me later this evening to preview the Super Super Bowl 56. We'll dive into all the headlines from around the NFL as well. 
But uh, thank you guys all for tuning in, to today, uh, tuning in today. I really appreciate it. Hope you guys enjoyed the passion. And um, as always, great talking to you. And we'll be back real soon. This is To The Point.